What's up, and welcome to Chapter 17 of AMSCO U.S. History, The Last West and the New South from 1865 to 1900. As always, please make sure to subscribe, help me reach 500, like, comment, and share with your friends. Thanks so much for your support. First up is the Great American Desert. So after the Civil War, many Americans began settling in the vast arid territories in the West that included the Great Plains, the Rocky Mountains, and the Western Plateau. And these lands were all west of the 100 degree west meridian. So why was it called the Great American Desert? Because pioneers who were passing on the way to the green valleys of Oregon in the gold fields of California noticed that these plains were really dry. There was very few rainfall. There weren't many trees in these plains, of course, and there wasn't enough moisture to support farming. Also, the winter blizzards and hot dry summers were really hard for some people. Although these open grasslands did have some good stuff like 15 million bison or buffalo, and these buffalo provided a great way of life for some people, and of course, the American Indians. Ever since the California Gold Rush in 1849, the West had become a mining frontier. So gold and silver was discovered in many places, but one of the most notable was the fabulous Comstock Lode. This was basically a mine in Nevada that produced more than $340 million in gold and silver. The biggest thing about this, though, was that it allowed Nevada to eventually gain the population necessary to eventually enter the Union. And it also created many great cities, one of which was Virginia City in Nevada. Mining operations soon grew in these areas as well, and one of the biggest groups of immigrants that came to mine were Chinese-born immigrants, and this represented about one-third of all the Western miners in the area. So the biggest thing was that native-born Amer native Americans resented the competition that these Chinese were bringing, so the Chinese could work for cheaper wages, and so as a result, the native-born Americans decided to institute a miner's tax, so $20 a month on all foreign-born miners. But eventually, they got really tired of it, so political pressure from Western states moved Congress to finally pass the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. So this 1882 law was basically the first major act of Congress to restrict immigration based on race or nationality. And we see this play out today when people still want to pass acts to prevent immigration from a certain area in the world. But the big thing about this act was that it prohibited further immigration to the United States by Chinese laborers until a long time later in 1965. Joseph Glidden was this inventor, and in 1874, he was able to invent this thing, barbed wire. Basically, it helped the farmers on the plains, better known as sodbusters, because many of them lived in homes made of sod bricks. It helped them because, of course, there wasn't much wood or trees on the plains. And finally, with barbed wire fences, farmers could fence in their lands to avoid wild animal attacks or their livestock from run running away. With all the white Americans moving onto these Native American lands, you can imagine the natives got pretty angered by this. So in the Second Sioux War, led by Sitting Bull, so this famous chief over here, and Crazy Horse, they led this group of warriors, and before they were defeated by the American army, they were able to ambush and destroy Colonel George Custer's command at Little Bighorn. And this was in the year 1876. Little Bighorn is in modern day Montana. So even though the natives eventually were defeated, it showed that they could actually defeat the American army for once. Unfortunately, it was also kind of like the last stand for these natives. Another famous chief was Chief Joseph, so he led this courageous effort of Nez Pierce Indians, so these were Indians who resided in Oregon, and they tried to get into Canada. Unfortunately, they were intercepted, and they ended in defeat and surrender by the year 1877. So unfortunately for these natives, time was really running out. The constant pressure of the U.S. Army forced tribe after tribe to comply with the government back in Washington, D.C., and in addition, the slaughter of most of the buffalo at this time also doomed the way of life for these plains people and other native Indians. So finally, a new stage and phase of a relationship between the United States government and American Indians was in the Dawes Act of 1887. This act basically was designed to break up tribal organizations, and many felt that American Indians could, through this, become civilized, quote-unquote, and law-abide law-abiding citizens. So the Dawes Act basically divided the tribal lands into plots of 160 acres. It really depended on family size. And U.S. citizenship was granted to the natives who stayed on the land for 25 years and adopted the habits of civilized life to the Americans. So over the years, the government was able to distribute many million acres of land. But even later, much of this land was sold to white settlers by the government, speculators for land, and even some American Indians themselves. Ultimately, the policy was a failure, and disease and poverty had reduced much of the population. All seemed to be lost, but American Indians did have one last effort to resist U.S. government controls, and this was a religious movement known as the Ghost Dance. So leaders of the movement believed that eventually prosperity would return to Native Americans. And the government's campaign to suppress the movement, famous medicine men, such as Sitting Bull, were 
One last effort by American Indians to resist U.S. government controls came through a religious movement known as the Ghost Dance. So not all hope was lost to these American Indians. So the leaders of the movement, such as the So Medicine Man Sitting Bull, as we learned earlier, tried to believe that prosperity could eventually return to the American Indians. Unfortunately, Sitting Bull was killed during his arrest one time, and eventually the U.S. Army gunned down more than 200 American Indian men, women, and children in the massacre of Wounded Knee in the Dakotas. And this final tragedy basically ended the Indian Wars, but also ended any possession of Indian sovereignty of their land. As mentioned, this was basically the end and the demise of Indians on their prairies. Also at this time, there were some books written by Americans sort of talking about natives. So one was by Helen Hunt Jackson. It was called A Century of Dishonor, written in 1881. And in 1881, this book really talked about sympathy for these American Indians, especially in the eastern United States. And it generally generated support for ending Indian culture through assimilation as well. So American Indians would adopt the American ways of life. So the reformers, they wanted formal education, job training, and conversion to Christianity for these Indians. So basically telling the Indians to ditch all their cultural customs. So boarding schools eventually were set up and American Indian children were segregated from their own people. Eventually, the hope was that these American Indians could learn white culture, such as farming and industrial skills, which they didn't really have before. Another work was Turner's Frontier Thesis, written in 1893. It was called The Significance of the Frontier in American History. Basically, there was this historian who argued that 300 years of frontier experience had shaped American culture. It promoted independence and individualism. And when the frontier was finally closed down toward the end of the 19th century, because most of the lands were taken already, this was thought as kind of bad for America because the frontier was kind of like a social leveler. It was powerful and it broke down class divisions, among other things, and it fostered social and political democracy. But it also encouraged wasteful attitudes such as overhunting bison at this time. To Turner, though, this closing was especially troubling because the frontier was like a safety valve. So like people who needed a new fresh start could just go to the frontier, but now it would be gone. Would America be contemned to repeat the patterns of class division and social conflict that troubled Europe? Many historians believe this might, while others don't, but eventually this ended the dominance of rural America and eventually led this phase in America to a decline. With many new people moving out west, there was also a new conservation movement because many of these new settlers were destroying the environment out there. So the biggest thing was there was a concern about deforestation. Many people were cutting down too many trees, and this sparked the conservation movement. And other things, such as breathtaking paintings and photographs of these western landscapes, convinced Americans that they needed to preserve western icons, such as Yosemite Valley. And eventually, Yellowstone became the first national park in 1872. Following this, to combat deforestation, there was the creation of forest reserves and federal forest service to regulate all these new lands. And Americans increasingly grew concerned about these loss of public lands and natural treasures. And eventually, new groups started to form up. So one were conservationists. They believe in the scientific management and regulated use of natural resources. Also, there were preservationists, such as the famous John Muir. He was the leading founder of the Sierra Club. And they basically aimed to preserve natural areas from human interference, so no development at all. Education efforts such as Arbor Day, so Tree Day, today's Earth Day, and the Audubon Society, such as they were looking at birds back then, and the Sierra Club really helped to grow and show that America really wanted to conserve their natural resources. In the South, change was happening as well post-Civil War, so there was this new concept of the New South created by Henry Grady, who was the editor of the Atlanta Constitution at the time. And basically, it was a gospel that the New South would have economic diversity and laissez-faire capitalism as seen before, like the bankers in the North. And to attract businesses, local governments offered tax exemptions to investors and the promise of low-wage labor to try to grow the South's industry and economy. So the growth of cities, primarily also fueled by the textile industry, really improved everything in America. Improved railroads also helped to connect everything in the South, and these efforts eventually came to become the New South. New places in the South became Big places of production, such as Birmingham, was the new leading steel producer, Memphis as a center for lumber, and Richmond, Virginia, the former capital of the Confederacy, as a major tobacco industry center. So all these new southern states eventually were able to overtake much of the north and become a major component in the U.S. economy as well. Textiles was the big deal, so in the Piedmont area of the southeast United States, Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina eventually overtook the New England states even from before, such as the Lowell Mills, as chief producers of textiles. With the North leaving after Reconstruction and the Supreme Court agreeing with the South more often, more and more Reconstruction Acts were struck down, and as a result, civil rights for African Americans decreased as well in the South. So in many civil rights cases, the court ruled that Congress could not legislate against the racial discrimination practices practiced by private citizens, and according to the 14th Amendment, this included corporations as well. 
and back then it also included some stuff used by the public. So in 1896, one black man with the support of other people, he was actually only one-eighth African-American, decided to challenge this separate railroad car case. And in Plessy versus Ferguson, the Supreme Court upheld a Louisiana law requiring separate but equal accommodations in this train. And so it basically applied to the rest of the United States as well. It basically ruled that the Louisiana law did not violate the 14th Amendment's guarantee of equal protection of the laws. And so people in America could, could continue discriminating against certain people if they wanted to. And this would take a long time to be repealed in, until 1954. With federal court support, there was this new wave of segregation laws, and they were most commonly known as Jim Crow laws. Basically, it goes along with Plessy versus Ferguson. These laws required segregated washrooms, drinking fountains, park benches, and other facilities, basically in all public places. Only the use of streets in most stores was not restricted according to a person's race. This is really the beginning of the big segregation movement in America after slavery. Many African Americans tried to counter this oppression, and one was Booker T. Washington. So Washington was actually a former slave, and he graduated college, and eventually he was able to help establish an industrial and agricultural school for African Americans in Tuskegee, Alabama, the Tuskegee Institute today. Basically, he tried to teach African Americans to learn skill trades, and that these virtues, and the virtues of hard work, moderation, and economic self-help could go much more farther than any social impact that the government was willing to pass to help African Americans. And he said that like earning money was kind of a way to vote and you could vote with your money. So he really emphasized racial harmony and economic cooperation. Basically, if African Americans supported their own businesses, they could eventually gain a much higher ground or at least an equal ground in American society. Others, however, such as W.E.B. Du Bois disagreed with him. So Du Bois was more about going for things such as immediate social justice. So he didn't really think much about economics. He just wanted to immediately have social justice. So this was in contrast with Booker T. Washington. Eventually, many years later, many people compare Washington to MLK and Du Bois as Malcolm X. They were kind of the antithesis of each other. And sometimes they criticize each other's ways and their visions in achieving equal civil rights. So Washington was all about self-reliance, while Du Bois wanted immediate social rights. Finally, there was Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells was actually a woman at this time, and there were many problems in the South. And Ida B. Wells, as the editor of the Memphis Free Speech, it was a black newspaper, campaigned against lynching and Jim Crow laws. So she received many death threats and even had her printing press destroyed. So eventually she had to move up north. But with other African-American leaders, they advocated migration out of the South. And eventually they were able to inspire many African-Americans at this time but also to combat a big issue at this time, which was lynching basically vigilante justice in the South against African Americans. So this has been chapter 17 of Ensco US History, the last West and the new South from 1865 to 1900. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you when we continue the story of America.